it's been five years since living the dream and a lot has happened in the world. How and when were these 11 songs worked on? Well, the unfortunate COVID situation uh, meant that this was a new writing process for us as far as no one could go anywhere. So we all got our heads down and um, did a lot of writing, took advantage of the fact that we couldn't do anything. So we may as well be productive by doing writing, seeing as we couldn't do any touring. So um, loads of ideas was written between the whole band. And then we brought all of the ideas to the table when we had a a time scale from the record company on uh, when we could go into the studio and, and record everything. So all the ideas got brought together and we listened to everything and and decided which ones we thought were the best ideas to be put forward. And the result is Chaos and Colour. Is there an overarching theme on Chaos and Colour? No, I mean, for a long time, <clears throat> Mick and Phil have been a uh, a writing duo um, and that didn't change this time round. They had their own ideas and they come together with theirs. But it's the first time that I was able to contribute. Uh, it, it became a time when I took advantage of not being able to do anything in the lockdown. So I got hold of a fantastic guitarist mate of mine that understands me, understands classic rock and I can feed a lot of ideas off him and he understands what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I was able to go round his house quite a few times and write loads of different ideas down. Same with Davey. Davey was able to write a game with Jeff uh, Scott Soto and um, it was just a, 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 the, the best opportunity for everybody to get as many ideas down as possible so that we could make a great album because living the dream went down so well we had to make sure that we had another great album to come out and not just you know <clears throat> some wasted riffs and bits and pieces you know it's it's very hard to take yourself away from songs that you write because uh, you're you know you believe in them all the time you think they're great but of course I think some albums from Uriah Heap that the fans don't like for certain different reasons. And it's always special for us to try and create the best music possible. We've been referring the album to Living the Dream, but uh, from your point of view, how has Uriah Heap's music evolved since, uh, you know, 2008's Wake the Sleeper and now to Chaos and Color? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the thing is about recording is the best way of recording as far as I'm concerned with the experience I have is if you do have that window of time of pre-production, you can think about the songs a bit more, think about arrangements, change this, bring that out where the melody should be going. There's a lot more time to tweet it. So it's good. And on a couple of the albums we had, we didn't have that time. The record, we were so busy touring so many countries, the record company were pressing for this schedule to get the album finished by that we had to just go in and do it um, with the ideas we had. And we didn't have time for um, pre-production. And for me, I think that's quite damaging, but I think we got away with it and I don't like getting away with it. I think we should produce the best we can every single time. But with the schedules that we have, sometimes with the pressure of the record company, it's just not possible. So sometimes you're sort of rushing an album when you don't really want to rush it. So the albums that we've had pre-production, Live in the Dream, Wake the Sleeper, Chaos and Colour, I think they've refined and have a bit of more of a maturity about them because we've been able to have a lot more time to tweet them around and stuff like that. Yeah, you said that you had a lot of ideas. Well, uh, during the pandemic time, where did the inspiration come? Well, I've had lots of ideas for a long time. It's just that the situation in which Phil and Mick operate, it hasn't been possible for um, Davey or me, Bernie, to get involved in the writing. They like to keep the format that they have uh, 
to themselves. And of course, Trevor used to do the same. Trevor would write his songs or co-write his songs and he would be separate. Sometimes it's just the, the connection or the chemistry that you have with somebody that makes a writing thing work. Um, but I've had lots of ideas and because I had the opportunity and because of the COVID forcing me down the road to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To be creative because I couldn't tour. Um, I just flooded Simon, my co-writer, and I said, look, we need another gypsy groove, right? Because gypsy goes down so well. And that tempo between 80 and 90 BPM is a real stomping, real great groove to have. So I said, I need to have this kind of uh, chord progression. And then once we got the foundation down for that, this is how the summarize, by the way, when we got the foundation down for that, um, we started working on uh, melodies. And then, you know, I, I'm a big fan of um, um, making, making the music really sort of interesting from start to finish. And we came up with um, that You'll Never Be Alone was a, a magical dream of a child. And the music came first. It was so magical, the way the music was all nice and magical, that word, but then sinister as well. Like the intro, I wanted the intro like July morning. We had a, a, a strong guitar kind of menacing intro um, and then the tranquility of the magic and then the menacing chaos in the middle where the kids are being found by mums and dads. Um, and to give it this overall interesting thing that I felt when we did the research, I felt certain elements uh, could be brought back from early heap. You know, so some of them, the, the magical side of it and the mystery side of it. Um, and I really wanted to to feature uh, the Hammond organ and guitar, uh, because that's one of the, you know, the two of the biggest traits of heap, the nice strong harmonies, but forceful Hammond organ, and of course Mick just doing his guitar. So all of those elements, I wanted to make sure I uh, were put into the ideas, as well as different feels for the song. If you notice, how the Sunrise is different to Hurricane, different to You'll Never Be Alone, and Fly Like an Eagle's completely different feel and groove to anything that Heap's done for a long while. So it was just made everything, gave, it gave uh, an opportunity to have a, a much diverse amount of feels, I felt. Like, so, and luckily the, the guys loved it and so did the the uh, producer and I enjoyed putting them down, it's great. If we can take a bit of a look uh, in the past, well, uh, you took over the drums from Lee Kerslake in 2007. Well, how did you originally join the band and how was your start? Well, I was doing lots of sessions and, and lots of demos and clinics and stuff for the drums and cymbals that I play. And I used to do a particular drum store up in Hull, north of England. And that's where Trevor Boulder was from. And I got on really well with the guy that run the um, shop called Phil Otin. And he used to book me regular every year, come back, come back, you know, two or three hundred musicians there. He'd love to see my clinics because I'm quite funny and quite Larry actually. Um, and they used to go down well. So they used to rebook me every time. And Phil always used to contact Trev, you've got to come and see Russ play. You've got to come and see Russ play. Well, with he being so busy, he wasn't able to see me play for quite a few of them. And then one of the clinics I did, he was off and he come to see me play. And afterwards he said that some of the best drumming I've heard for a long while was fantastic. Are you rushing off home? tonight i said no i've got a hotel tonight because it was like three and a half four hours from my house he said well if you're free tomorrow do you want to come back uh, come around my house for lunch we'll have a chat so i thought yeah it'll be great so we become mates uh, from that day and it wasn't till about seven years later or something i think it was uh, he won me up and said um Russ, we're holding auditions for Heap, and I think you'll be absolutely perfect. Are you up for doing a job? I said, well, go tell me some details. He said, well, we've just signed a record deal. At that time, it was with Sanctuary, um, and that was for the Wake the Sleeper. It was Sanctuary at that time. Um, he said, then we've got 18 month world tour to go with it. So I said, well, yeah, of course, you know, I'm not, I'm not an idiot. Great legendary band, right, playing great music. Yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> 
Well, I had to go through the audition process because the management have organised it. So apparently there was 240 drummers worldwide and a lot of them were like people on the phone trying to blag a gig. And they whittled it down to the last 40 drummers in London over two weeks. And then um, I made myself uh, have the audition and I got the audition then. And there was five songs to learn. And apparently a lot of the drummers were a disaster. They didn't play the double-handed shuffle where it could completely ruin the, the whole feel and groove if you don't do the, the proper Lee Curse Lake shuffle thing. Um, and then other drummers weren't hitting them hard enough. And then other drummers hadn't learned the songs probably, would you believe? They didn't even learn it probably. And so when I came in, they said, have you learned the five songs? And I said, no. And their faces were like, oh my God, no. I said, I've learned the whole live set and I can do a gig tomorrow. And they were so excited and happy that I'd prepared myself and done such a good job. And then when I played, because I am a very, very much a leader drummer, very powerful and very forceful, I could tell that they were relieved that I took command of the drum chair. And um, after the audition, that was it. I got it straight on after the audition. Mick said, yeah, you're in the band, done. Let's go round to the pub now and get pissed. So that's what we did. <laughs> and then it was about three weeks later, we were straight in doing Wake the Sleeper. That's how quick the turnaround was. And then I had to forget that, learn the live set and do the first ever gig, April 17th in Finland. Albums, a lot of gigs, you know, looking back at the last 16 years for you personally, what have been the biggest moments? Biggest, but well, I mean, it's always great to play some of the big festivals, Wacken, Hellfest, some of the biggest festivals in Europe. That's always a great crack, you know, you get to meet the other bands because you don't get to meet some of your your mates in other bands because you're always touring separately. So festivals are a great time to catch up, you know, especially when we've done so many gigs with Deep Purple um, and, you know, Manfred Mann and Nazareth. Uh, I can't think of them all now, but I mean, you know, we're always chatting to... Uh, everybody at the festival was a good time to catch up. So that they they've been great fun and some. What's what's really good about it is that every country has got their own way of showing their appreciation with the fans, and it's it makes it feel so special if we go to Finland or if we go to Sweden, we go to Germany, Austria, Japan. Australia, it doesn't matter where it is, you know that it's special for that country and you get a really warm feeling that they're so happy to uh, to see you, to meet you, to hear the music and to, to enjoy the night with you. Um, there's so many special um, moments that I can't really pick out any. As I said, some of the big festivals, yeah, we did uh, Sao Paulo in uh, Brazil, 120,000 people. You know, and, and all you saw was a sea of heads. I mean, those feelings are absolutely amazing. Then we've done some clubs to 1,200, 1,500 people, but they're this close and they're all around you and the atmosphere is just electric because they're all like, and it's, it's brilliant. So all of it, I love all of it, you know, for all different reasons. And the good thing about Heap is you'll do 1,200, 1,500 seater clubs and then you'll do the slightly bigger theatres, 2,000, 3,000 theatres. Then you'll do the um, uh, sort of ice rinky 5,000 seaters, and then you'll go up to, we did Judas Priest in America, we supported them uh, four or five years ago and they were like 20,000 seater you know, stadium type things. And then you've got your, your festival. So we get to play everything and they've all got something nice about them.